Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Rouse IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of UPSC examination. Today we are going to take up Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 31st of August 2020. The articles which we are going to cover today are displayed on the screen. Let's now begin the discussion. This first article which we have taken for discussion is an editorial appearing on page number 6. Despite the messaging, it is still advantage China. And we have combined this particular discussion with that of a data point which appears on page number 7. So uh, the article actually highlights the current uh, downfall of uh, industrial development or you can say the saturation of the level at which the Chinese are developing right now, especially in the manufacturing sector. And then it talks about various opinions and views which have taken a view that this level of saturation which Chinese have achieved and the decline in industrial activity in China can be an opportunity for India. And then this article debunks this idea that a downfall of China will be an opportunity for India. And it gives various arguments in favor of why she thinks so. So we'll start by first understanding the causes because of which the manufacturing has started to decline in China. And then we will understand why is it not an opportunity for India. Through data point analysis, we will understand how China has subtly shifted itself from low and middle end manufacturing to very, very high end manufacturing, adding a lot of value. So all of us understand and we know that China has been the global manufacturer, especially in past two decades. It has surpassed almost all the nations across the world, especially dealing in electronics manufacturing. Although it is almost the largest producer in almost all the stuff. But in last three to four years, manufacturing has started to shift from China. Because as the China has developed and the incomes of the people and the labors have risen, it has led to rising labor cost. So the minimum wages in China have become much higher than what they were in two decades ago. The peculiar population policy which Chinese have followed has led to shortage of workforce. Then recently, in last four to five years, it's continued trade war with US and the imposition of a lot of duties on behalf of United States of America, which also happens to be one of the largest market of the Chinese production, has taken a lot of toll on Chinese production. Then in last 10 years, a lot of countries of ASEAN region have emerged as manufacturing hubs which are giving stiff competition to China and finally in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic not only there was a lockdown in a major region of China but also the way China has handled and the role it has played in the spread of pandemic across the world has enraged various countries which are now taking economic actions or sanctions against China and hence According to a lot of economists and thinkers, this is an opportunity for India. This is the opportunity which India was waiting for and should have been waiting for. Because if you look at the contribution of the manufacturing sector in our overall GDP, it has remained dismal. The transformation from agriculture to manufacturing to services has not happened and the manufacturing stage was skipped in our country. Now we still want manufacturing to play a big role because we want to provide employment to millions of people and no better option than to provide them jobs in manufacturing sector, especially the lowest skilled manufacturing sector. And hence in this regard, the author puts forward the idea that this cannot be taken as an opportunity for India. And let us now discuss the points which author has put forward. Now, the first point is that it is true that a lot of companies were planning relocation out of China. They were planning to shift their production in some other countries. But very few countries are now planning such relocation in 2020. Most of them have given up this idea. Now, why is it so? And the reason is that don't forget that China is not only a base for export. 
Global companies don't just utilize China to produce their goods and export them outside China. They also want to make use of the second largest market of the world. And hence, all those companies for whom China is a big market, they will never shift. Only those companies can think of shifting which just use China to manufacture but actually don't sell their products within the Chinese boundaries and there are very few such companies. So to think that this is an opportunity for India and if India presents itself as an alternative to Chinese then this optimism is not good because to start with there are not many countries. Then the author says that even if we assume that there are certain companies indeed which want to relocate. And then she says that it will be laughable conjecture to assume that they will relocate to India. Now if you look at the data, the toys and cameras have already shifted to Mexico. A sizable chunk of PC or personal computer manufacturing has shifted to Taiwan. Automobile industry already in a good shape in our country has been unable to attract the relocated chunk and which has gone to Thailand and Vietnam and finally textile of course you must be knowing has shifted to Bangladesh and Vietnam. So keeping in view the trend which has existed in last two to three years not much has come to India. Rather it has gone to Mexico, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, Bangladesh and Vietnam. So to assume that all those companies relocating will automatically think for India is not correct. Since the person who has written the article has personally interviewed a lot of CEOs, she recounts that a lot of trouble has been created in multinational companies and investment circles because of anti-competitive practices being run by our government. Now the first is the recent rules on e-commerce which have created a lot of flutter and then various kinds of actions taken from time to time. For example, five years ago there was imposition of retrospective taxation on few of the foreign firms which not only led to a foreign arbitration but also maligned the image of India as trusted foreign investment destination. And hence because of these factors because the government openly emphasizes Atmanirbhar Bharat, the government of India actively encourages the domestic companies. Because of all these factors, investors are not very optimistic about India. And finally, the advantages which China offers, they are not being offered in India as of now. For example, their manufacturing infrastructure is just unparalleled. So one of the parts of manufacturing infrastructure is the production of capital goods. So capital goods are that goods which are used in the production of other items or goods. So they are like a capital investment which help in increasing the production capacity. Now comes the data point which is given on page number seven and these four images actually throw light on absolute dominance of China as far as production of capital goods are concerned. Let's just focus on the first two images on the top row. So the first image shows the percentage of overall exports on the Y column and the year on the X column or X axis. Now if you focus on the four lines, you will see the green line indicates the export of capital goods. So 20 years ago in 1990s, the share of capital goods in overall exports of China was around 10% and look at where it is now. Of the overall exports of China, more than 50% of the export is that of capital goods and less than 5% of the products being exported by China consists of raw material. So this is the biggest indicator of level of development of a country. If a country exports raw material, in majority, it is not a developed country. For example, Brazil, Central Asian countries, Russia. Whereas if a country majorly exports consumer goods or capital goods, it is a highly advanced nation. For example, Germany and China. So this is only for exports. If it is exporting more than 50% of the total good as capital goods, it has access to such a resource, which India does not have. 
So this indicates that a lot of manufacturing of capital goods is going on in China itself which are readily available in that country and hence whatever you need to produce whatever robots you need for production of let's say an automobile you have that then and there in China itself then this next graph shows the overall capital goods market the red line indicates the share of america in the capital goods export whereas the blue line indicates the share of china in the capital goods export and you can see the inflection point or you can see that 2005 was a very very important year till then america was the largest supplier of the capital goods but post 2005 it has been taken over by china and right now the share of america in overall capital goods export is 10% whereas that of china is around 24% so it is 2.5 times that of america so that is the level of development which china has achieved so far we have seen about exports let's now talk about imports by various countries so these are japan india us and australia and if we focus on this graph the y axis denotes the Chinese share of capital goods in the imports of these countries. So the first thing which you can decipher is that the dependence on China for all these countries for Japan, for India, for US and Australia has grown significantly in last 20 to 30 years. So in 1988, all these countries almost did not import anything from China, especially dealing with the capital goods. But look at where they are now in 2015. Japan imports 50% of its capital goods and machineries from China. Similarly, India also imports around 40 to 45% of the overall capital goods. Although America's reliance is a bit low, but nonetheless it is still at 30%. Now one thing is very very noteworthy is that if you see India's curve, it shows a dip after 2016 which means that post 2016 our dependence on China as far as capital goods is concerned is continuously declining which is good to know. Similarly Japan has also started to minimize or reduce its dependence on China. Similarly if we talk about other kinds of or other categories of products for example electrical equipments then we see that scenario has not even changed. Then we see something similar. So this graph shows China's share in total imports of such items in these countries. So Hong Kong, obviously it makes sense. It imports around 55 to 60% of overall electrical equipment, machinery and mechanical appliances from China. Similarly, US around 40% and Singapore around 20%. So almost all the most developed countries of the world are acutely dependent on Chinese production even now because this is 2018 data. So these four graphs in totality substantiate the fact that not only China is undisputed champion as far as manufacturing and industrial production is concerned but it will be very very hard for India to displace China especially in a short period of time. Also because of the fact that India's skilled human resource is pathetic. We all know and we have already discussed this in our DNS many times that our working force does not take proper skilling and hence it creates a lot of problem not only for industrial production but when we want to convert a concept into a design and finally we want to produce something it creates a lot of trouble over there. And then author highlights one last point is that the massive special economic zones of China and the value they add to overall GDP and value addition in, our, in their country cannot be compared with Indian SEZs. Now you must have read how manufacturing SEZs have failed because of various reasons. And only SEZs dealing in information technology services have taken off. And so India's SEZ have failed whereas China's SEZ have blossomed and they were the engines of growth for their country and since India's manufacturing has not taken up and since India's SEZs themselves have not taken up and started it is difficult to think that even if the manufacturing shift where will it take place because your SEZs have not worked 
and those were the places where we expected that manufacturing will actually kick start but even after providing special incentives in regions like SEZs if we were not able to encourage manufacturing how can we think of companies relocating to our country so this is it as far as this article is concerned which raises very very valid arguments as far as relocation of industries from china is concerned as you can see in another news prime minister modi has encouraged manufacturing of toys in our country and this is also one of the arguments but it needs to be seen how effective these calls for manufacturing prove themselves to be prove to be but it still remains to be seen how effective they will be let's now move on to the next discussion so this article a development that will hardly put india at ease appears as a lead article on page number 6 Now the World Bank's doing business report is considered to be one of the most authoritative reports to measure the ease of doing business across different countries. It has been used as a valuable tool by countries for example India to improve their business climate and attract investments. However, a number of irregularities have been reported related to the authenticity and integrity of the data published in the report in last few years. And hence in this regard World Bank has decided to pause the publication of this report. It has asked its internal audit team to perform an audit of the process of the data collection and review the methodology of report to ensure data integrity. So from the perspective of UPSC examination, of course we should understand basics about doing business report, India's performance on ease of doing business index and flaws in the report. But before that, Let us see what kind of questions have been asked in UPSC with respect to this particular report. In 2019 itself UPSC asked which of the following is not a sub index of World Bank's ease of doing business index. Then in 2016 UPSC had asked India's ranking in the ease of doing business index is sometimes seen in news. which of the following has declared that ranking so you can understand that this index has not only been important for indian government but has also been important from the perspective of upsc examination now as far as the report is concerned the economies are ranked on their ease of doing business from the economy number 1 to that of last so a high ease of doing business ranking means a regulatory environment that is very very conducive to the starting and operation of a local firm so in totality the doing business index covers 12 areas of business regulation all of which you can see on the screen now let us talk about india's performance india has successfully improved its position from 142nd rank in 2014 to 63 in 2020 Now it is to be highlighted that government of India has set a target of bringing India within the top 50 rankings in doing business index. So India's score improved from 67 to 71 in 2020. Let us now talk about the reasons because of which World Bank has instituted an inquiry or you can say audit of its own report. So first and foremost is the poor correlation between economic growth and ease of doing business ranking. In spite of improvement in ranks, most economies have failed to see improvement in FDI inflows or GDP growth rates. Now you should understand that one of the reasons why the countries insisted on performing better and better on ease of doing business report was that they wanted to be seen as a business friendly country and they expected that as their performance will increase or they will witness inflow of foreign investments but that hasn't happened so in fact improvement in the rankings of countries such as russia has been accompanied by stagnation in investment on the other hand countries such as india and china had attracted huge fdi inflows in spite of poor rankings between 2005 and 15 but when india's ranking actually improved there is not much increase in fdi 
so we can say that there is poor correlation between economic growth and rank so as we just discussed 2005 to 15 india's rank was very poor but we saw massive fdi growth rate since 2015 to 20 when we actually improved upon eodb we have seen stagnation in fdi so there is not much correlation between economic growth and the ranking then the data itself is quite unrepresentative because the data is collected only from two cities across country which is mumbai and delhi for computing the index for india and hence it is not the representative of the situation of entire country so if the ranking of our country is being improved in this particular index it is actually the condition of delhi and mumbai and the condition of doing business in these two cities have improved which was extrapolated for whole of the country so in overall country it could be the other way as well but obviously this report and the way it is calculated those things will not be reflected there is also a case for selection bias now if you see both delhi and mumbai are majorly service based economies where the higher focus is always on easing restrictions in services sectors and lower focus on improving business climate in manufacturing or in agriculture sector so when india's rank improves it improves first because the steps have been taken in these two cities and those steps are majorly limited to services sectors and hence in order to expect the improvement in the ranking to be reflected on improvement in let's say manufacturing production will be injustice to the report itself then this last point deals with the lack of focus of this report on labor laws now we know that complexities in labor laws is considered as one of the biggest hindrances to ease of doing business however the report does not explicitly considers the indicator of labor laws for calculating the score itself and hence any estimation of improvement of business environment will not be accurate so the flaws in the report indicate that the government of india should stop chasing ranks on an index which is considered to be faulty at the same time the world bank should see the halt in publication of the report as an opportunity to address the flaws which exist in this report let's now move on to the next news this article haldi loses its flavor amid pandemic appears on page number 1 so if you are keeping in touch with the newspaper then you must have read about the declaration of odisha's famous kand mahal haldi as one of the geographical indicators and hence following that thousands of farmers adopted the cultivation of this particular haldi hoping to reap a lot of benefit out of the harvest but as we all know just like all other aspects of our lives even the demand of haldi has been impacted because of covid-19 and hence the farmers have been left high and dry as procurement of condiment has been badly impacted due to pandemic so in this regard we will first understand what are iprs or intellectual property rights why is it important to legally protect the intellectual properties and then we shall understand the geographical indication or what is gi tag why is gi tag given and finally we'll understand what are the benefits which accrue after a particular commodity has been declared as a gi tag then we will also go on and have a look at few of the recent which have been recognized as geographical indicator during last one year but before that let us first understand why is it important to know about gi tags of course intellectual property rights forms a part of our mains syllabus but apart from that in upsc prelims 2015 it was asked which of the following has or have been accorded geographical indication status statement 1 was banaras brocade and sarees statement 2 was rajasthani dal bati in churma statement 3 was tirupati laddu select the correct answer using the code given below and the codes can be seen on the screen now we are not going to answer this question right at the beginning we are going to see the list of the geographical indicators and try to find out which of these actually find their place in the pdf released by the ministry and we shall see which ministry is the one which keeps the track of all the geographical indicators in our country so let's begin 
Since geographical indicator is a kind of intellectual property, let's briefly go through what intellectual property itself is. So when people invent things or they write something or they create an artistic work or design or even if they provide a symbol for let's say uh, an industrial house, all these are nothing but creations of their mind. And we want to recognize people for their creativity and we also want them to earn financial benefits. Now why do we want that? Because we want to spur innovation in our society. We want to foster the environment of creativity. If we don't recognize people for the innovative work they have done or for artistic value that they have created and we don't allow them to reap financial benefits out of them, then the motivation level in our society for creating or for entrepreneurship will fall drastically and hence there is a need for providing a legal recognition or protection in various forms. Now if we talk about intellectual property rights protection, there are various mechanisms. For example, we have something known as patent, we have copyrights, we have trademarks and we also have geographical indicators. So. The topic of today's discussion is geographical indication, but nonetheless, all other things are important for you as well. So now we want you to comment as to what is patent, what is copyright and what is trademark. Of course, trademark can be easily distinguished from copyright and patent, but you need to be clear as to what are the differences between patent and a copyright. So do find out and let us know if you know or not the way you answer questions help us keep track of your progress and lets us know that what we have to cover, how we have to cover in our DNS. Before starting the discussion, focus on what images appear on your screen. What you see is a GI tag for Mysore Silk. Whichever sari or silk product contains these words written in this manner will indicate that not only this product has been made in the region recognized by government of India as an area where the Masur silk is manufactured. But it also indicates a certain level of quality and it also indicates a unique process through which not only the silk is manufactured but also the process through which the fabric is manufactured. Then focus on this particular symbol. It is a GI tag for Darjeeling tea. It indicates that the packet on which this symbol is present is cultivated in Darjeeling region of our country and hence a particular taste, aroma and quality is guaranteed. This is what GI tag is. It identifies a good as originating in a specific region and the quality and the reputation which this product will have is because it is being manufactured in that particular region. Now you might ask why is it important to connect a product with its origin after all we can produce tea at various other places. Similarly there is nothing special about Mysore silk or Banarsi sarees are not unique and the whole process of creation of Banarsi saree can be recreated even in Surat and hence why this special GI tag is being used. Now for that you need to understand that almost all the products especially dealing with agriculture and handicraft are special in three manners. First of all the method of production is passed on from generation to generation and often it is transferred as a secret from one generation to another and hence the way Banarsi silk sarees are manufactured and weaved will be very very different from the way it is done in the Masur, in the famous Masur sarees. And hence, an uh, entrepreneur from Banaras, if she tries to manufacture and sell some of her sarees which look similar to the Masur saree and she tries to brand them as Masur saree, would be like cheating the customer because you can't simply replicate this process. This is not an industrial manufacturing of toys which you can recreate anywhere. Similarly, the ingredients which are used in these products are very very local. First of all, these ingredients are not found everywhere. Even if they are found, their quality varies from region to region. And also, since the environmental conditions change, it leads to the change in the way the product appears and its taste also. Just take the example of Darjeeling tea. Do you think that the taste and aroma of Darjeeling tea would be same if it is grown in Himachal or in Uttarakhand or 
or in nilgiri hills it will be very very different so it is very very important for both consumers as well as producers that there should be gi tags for products which are very very famous and which have a place of origin because of which they are very famous let us now look at the legal framework which recognizes geographical indication all of you should know that as far as intellectual properties are concerned there are two global framework first is paris convention for protection of industrial property which recognizes geographical indication as a part of ipr similarly there is something which is known as trips the full form of which is trade related aspects of ipr which again recognizes gi or geographical indication as one of the aspects in which we protect intellectual property rights so this is as far as the international arena is concerned what about our country now parliament passed a law in 1999 which actually came into effect in 2003 geographical indication of goods registration and protection act 1999 this has not only legalized geographical indication but has also enabled various provisions for the protection of the rights of the community which holds the geographical indication now let us understand why is it important or how does award of gi tag to a product and to a region helps or you can also call them benefits of having been recognized as one of the gis now one of the biggest benefits or advantage of having been recognized as gi is that that product and that locality which has been traditionally manufacturing that product is saved from unfair competition so all of us understand the exquisite and intricate banarsi brocade and banarsi sarees which have been traditionally manufactured in the region of banaras now let's say there is no gi tax so far for banaras a person invests in some plants and machinery and opens up another factory in let's say maharashtra starts manufacturing lookalikes of banarsi sarees and then exports them as banarsi sarees now since these people are traditional handicraft they don't have access to so much of capital and since the people in the developed market as well as in india are not able to distinguish between the real banarsi saree and the fake banarsi saree what will happen in due course of time is that people who have been traditionally involved in this particular business since thousands of years will be out competed by the manufacturing plant opened up in maharashtra and hence there lies the significance of gi once gi tag has been given to all the manufacturers of banarsi saree doing business out of banaras no one else can use the name banarsi saree on their brands application of gi tag on a product also gives credibility to the product once you see a gi tag of government of india on a tea packet saying darjeeling tea gi you are assured of the fact that that tea has been plucked from the farms in darjeeling area itself and hence it fetches a good price to the producer because consumer knows that whatever quality i am looking for this is the one since it prevents the traditional artisans from being out competed it protects the artisan community also it reduces regional disparity which has been created in our country due to industrial development now once we will see the list very soon you will realize that gi tags are scattered all across the country and hence the benefits arising out of gi and its use is reaching throughout the country and hence this is one of the ways in which we can minimize the regional disparity as well so as you can see on the screen office of the controller general of patents designs and trademarks belongs to department for promotion of industry and internal trade ministry of commerce and industry government of india so this is the particular branch of government of india which has been made in charge for gis and it releases a data this is the list of geographical indicators which has been announced by the government so as you can see the news appears with respect to kandmahal haldi which is the first geographical indicator during this phase 
then is odisha rasgulla which was a matter of dispute between both west bengal and odisha then we have a lot of agriculture handicrafts food stuffs being recognized so it is advised that you go through this list especially the ones which have been recognized during the last year now i would like to bring your attention to this one important aspect that gi tag is not limited to the domestic products themselves and as you can see the entry number 345 is irish whiskey manufactured from ireland similarly there are other foreign made products especially the cheese from italy so let us just search so this you can see is a cheese parmigiano reggiano is a very very famous cheese manufactured in a very very small region of italy and so there are other scotches whiskies cheese and there are various other products which have foreign origin and their gi has also been recognized most important to memorize right now for the prelims 2020 is kashmir saffron from jammu kashmir tanjavur pethworks from tamil nadu Arumbavur wood carvings handicraft Tamil Nadu Telina rumal from Telangana and Soharai cover painting from Jharkhand This brings us back to the question Banaras sarees Rajasthani dal bati and churma and Tirupati laddu which of these three have been recognized as geographical indications so let us just quickly go through this list and try to find out if Banaras brocades and sarees is a indicator or not and you can see in 2009 and 10 it already has been recognized as Banaras brocades and sarees belonging to Uttar Pradesh then Tirupati laddu has been recognized again in 2009 and 10 and Rajasthani dal bati and churma has yet not been recognized and and this question was asked basically because there was a lot of demand for the recognition of Rajasthani dal bati churma as one of the geographical indicators so this is it as far as geographical indication is concerned now this particular article appears on page number 8 karnataka chief minister flags off roro train to sholapur karnataka chief minister b s yadurappa on sunday flagged off the maiden roll on roll off train from bengaluru to sholapur through video conferencing Now this particular roll off roll on train will transport goods from Pinya industrial area and each truck will be loaded with around 30 tons of weight it will cover a distance of around 682 kilometers now all these details are not important what is important is the meaning and the significance of the word roro or roll on roll off now it is important from the perspective of prelims as well as mains examination while in prelims examination this term can be given along with options and you might be asked to identify which of them explains the term correctly but as far as mains examination is concerned it is one of the very very important step which both state governments as well as the central government has taken in past 5 years in order to promote not only trade and commerce but also manufacturing in our country and let us understand how so we obviously understand that manufacturing in any country is regionally scattered there are a lot of production centers from where the produce is shipped via trucks and railways to the important ports of a country at the ports these goods and products are unloaded kept on a port and when the ship arrives all these products are reloaded into the ships then it travels through seas and oceans to the destination country where all the products in the containers have to be first unloaded kept on the port and when the trucks and railways arrive they are again loaded into trucks and railways and finally the consignment is taken through trucks and railways to the market now just go through this process again don't you think that somehow if we can get rid of unloading loading and unloading and loading four times in one journey of a good then we are going to save a lot of time isn't it and that is what roll off and roll on is so the process which we have just understood is known as lolo which is lift on and lift off which is basically loading and unloading let us now understand how roll on and roll off is different in roll on and roll off ships which are basically cargo ships are designed to carry the wheeled cargo such as cars trucks trailers 
and in some cases railway wagons also now we understood that how difficult it is to do loading unloading four times in a single journey and in case of roll on and roll off the trucks are basically rolled directly into the ships as you can see in the image on the screens saving a lot of time which is utilized for loading and unloading and it also takes space because these consignments then have to be stored on a port for many many days once the ships are full they carry the trucks to the destination territory or country where again there is no need for unloading and loading the trucks need to be started and they will directly roll out of the ship and reach the destination so now you can easily understand that how this roll on and roll off will save a lot of time now a natural query can arise in your mind that why it wasn't done earlier and the answer to that is roll on and roll off requires special mechanisms within the ships themselves and also you can understand that so many trucks rolled into ship will make it heavy and hence not all ships are compatible with this kind of process not just that changes in port infrastructure is also required so if we talk about the benefits of roro over lolo one of the benefits is we have already discussed it saves a lot of time especially in a country like india which finds its name way below in ease of doing business index and one of the struggles which almost all the players in the commercial sector go through is massive delays caused at the ports due to this loading and unloading time so that can be easily solved since cars and lorries can drive straight onto the ship at one port and then drive off at the other port within a few minutes of the ship docking at the port it saves a lot of time for the shipper apart from that the loading and unloading process when repeated twice at both the ends of the ocean leads to a lot of damage and especially if the consignment is that of a very very highly value added products for example supercomputers items related to space technology defense and many other objects if they are high value added products roll on and roll off has special advantage because you don't have to unload the product you just have to make sure that your products are loaded with care on the trucks and ultimately trucks will roll into the ship saving the fragile items and other high value products from being destroyed now in this case or the news which appears in the newspaper today is not with respect to the ships rather it deals with the roll on and roll off railways now just as the way trucks are rolled into the ships as and the railway wagons are rolled into the ships trucks are rolled into the railways as well and you must have seen the consignment of army moving through your city at some point in your life you must have seen long trains carrying army tanks trucks jeeps that is an example of roll on and roll off which has been utilized by army since 50 70 years but now it is being introduced into commercial sector as well and again the same thing when a good has to be transported from mumbai to let's say up it has to be first loaded at the land port terminal in mumbai and unloaded in noida now, but now a lot of time will be saved as the trucks will themselves ride on the railway and once the train arrives in noida it can drive off within few minutes as soon as the train stops leading to considerable reduction in the time which product takes while traveling from production unit to the consuming unit this article appears on page number 3 award winning cardiologist dr padmavati passes away now we need to discuss dr padmavati for upsc examination but because she has contributed in a big big way to India's overall medical science field now she is prominent because she was awarded with padma bhushan and padma vibhushan both she was born in burma born and brought up in burma where she did her medical science uh, initial medical science schooling and then due to japanese invasion of burma her family fled to india and eventually she went on to pursue higher studies in medical science from england as well as from america 
those things are not so much important what is important is that she is in a real sense symbol of women empowerment in our country she was a noted cardiologist or a doctor who specializes in the matters of heart related diseases but she also had many firsts to her credit so she was the one who opened first cardiac clinic as well as the cath lab at lady harding medical college which is a very very prestigious college in delhi then she was the one who initiated research into cardiology as far as medicine goes so she instituted doctorate of medicine in cardiology and then the person who set up cardiology department in maulana azad medical college is none other than padmavati shiva ramakrishna ayer she passed away at the age of 103 and you should read as to how fit she was as she was fond of swimming which she quit around 5 years ago so she was swimming and playing lawn tennis until the age of 95 years let's now move on to the question of the day the question of the day for 30th of august 2020 was supply chain resilience initiative has been proposed by japan and it includes and the right answer is india and australia the question of the day for today is which of the following have gi tag kashmir saffron telia rumal gorakhpur terracotta select the correct answer using the code given below a one only b one and two only c two and three only d one two and three 